In a previous video, we went through the schematic design or the main considerations for schematic design for Silink Sync based system on module. You can see that in my 50th video on my channel that goes through the schematic, what considerations you need for DDR memory, power supplies, and so forth. In this video, I'd like to go through the layout and routing of this finished system on module, just some key points, nothing too in depth, just to give you an overview of what considerations are required when you start moving to BGA packages and fairly high speed designs. This design and many of my more complicated designs, I typically always do with Altium Designer. If you'd like to try and follow along and give Altium Designer a try for yourself, Altium is offering a free trial of Altium Designer and you can go to altium.com forward slash yt forward slash Phil's lab to give it a try for yourself. And I'll leave a link in the description below. I'm also currently working on a further PCB design course and this time with a much more advanced topic and specifically this entire board step by step. So starting from an empty project, going through the schematic, why we choose certain components, why we choose certain valued resistors, capacitors, how to choose decoupling, package planning, pinout planning, DDR memory interfaces, power delivery, stack ups, build up, and much, much more. And a brief detail is given here. And for this, I'd like to just collect, if you want to, of course, and your email if you're interested in this course, and I'll send out emails information when this course is ready, which should be by the end of this year. And I'll leave a link to this in the description below. Before we begin looking at the layout and routing, let's familiarize ourselves briefly again with the schematic and the components of this system on module. In Alton Design, you can create these kind of overview sheets and then have uh, relevant schematic pages underneath this. So if we look at the overview sheet for this Zbrett, which is this sync system on module, we have a couple of different schematic pages. One is for power, because we need several different power supplies for this FPGA or system on chip as well as a DDR termination regulator, which we'll see the layout and routing for later as well. We have some various power, that is decoupling for the zinc, JTAG configuration pins and so on. We have a programmable logic part and we have a processing system part of the zinc. Then of course we have some DDR memory, we have some EMMC memory, QSPI memory and so forth, as well as these mezzanine connectors because this is a system on module where we use board to board connectors to connect this to some sort of carrier board. The nice thing about a system on module is that we create this kind of main board where we have complicated routing, DDR and so forth, and once we've designed that, all the carrier or daughter board designs are usually a lot simpler and we don't have to redesign all this BGA stuff. So the first page, uh, we have the power supplies, so we have this quad buck converter. For the system on chip, the zinc specifically, we need fairly high current low voltage supplies, so anything from, from 1 volt for the internal and core voltage, 1.8 volt for certain banks, 1.35 volts for the DDR memory, as well as 3.3 volts for various other banks. These also have to be sequenced. So you can see here we apply input power, then we need one volt, 1.8 and so forth. The way we do that is via these enable and power good pins. So once an, a power good goes high for one, we use that to enable the different signal. And we just have an LED indicating, okay, the power is on. Below we also have this DDR3 VTT regulator, which is the termination regulator, which provides essentially half of the DDR3 supply voltage for the termination resistors. So if we briefly go to the zinc DDR page, we can see we have all of these termination resistors on the address command and control lines, and these are terminated with about 40 ohm resistors and pulled up to this VTT regulation voltage, and these require fairly heavy decoupling as well. So let's go over to the PCB layout and routing and see how this is laid out. Here's a 3D view in Altium Designer. You can see I've segmented this system module in a certain way. So I have my main system on chip, my zinc over here, the DDR3 memory very close, as well as these QSPI and EMC flash memories really close as well. Then further away from this main chip, but because this is a fairly small module, this is about 50 millimeters by 40 millimeters, I didn't have, of course, too much space to move this buck converter far away as possible. So ideally you should have maybe more clearance between switching power supplies and these components over here. So this is my quad buck converter and this is my VTT DDR3 termination regulator. Just a brief look at the bottom side, you can see we have the three mezzanine connectors and these are arranged in a way that we have a power input, power output, we have the MIO, which is from the processing system of the zinc, and we have the programmable logic, which is essentially the FPGA fabric connections of the zinc chip. And we have various mounting holes, M3, and all of these decoupling capacitors and crystals on the bottom. But going back to this quad buck connote over here, you can see there's a QFN package, so not the easiest to root out because we essentially have 
this large ground pad underneath so we can't root any churches underneath and everything has to go out of these fairly fine pads and then spread out. So you can see it's a fairly symmetrical design. We have output inductors as well as output capacitors and some smaller input capacitors. So what we want to do with buck converter layout is always keep our loop areas or the high current loop areas as small as possible. So trying to keep everything as tight as possible as soon as we go out of a pad don't just make it a very small thin trace but I'm rather using these polygon pores which connect without thermal relief to my SMD components. So you can see here I'm breaking out and I'm immediately getting larger and connecting up to my SMD components. So for example let's take this 3.3 volt rail over here we have our input at 5 volts with a decoupling capacitor very close to the relevant pin and our switch node output for the 3.3 volts is buck underscore LX4 and you can see I've labeled all my net names so this doesn't have some sort of odd net name I know exactly what this node does. Feed that straight into my inductor, my magnetic element and then into my decoupling capacitor or my bypass capacitor. And you can see I'm using quite a number of vias which then go into internal power planes and we'll go through the layer stack up in just a second. As a rule of thumb a typical via will carry about one to two amps so because I want to have this spread over a couple of years for safety and reliability. So I have multiple current carrying vias. And I do the similar thing for these other supply voltages. You can see some of these vias I have left untented so they're not covered with solder mask. And the reason is I can use them as test points, for example. So if I'd like to probe the voltage, I have uh, these mounting hole pads actually connected to ground. And then I can simply connect, for example, a probe between ground as mounting pad and one of these uncovered vias or untented vias. You can see I have that all across the board as well. So on the bottom side a lot of these signal vias are untented for me to be able to test and check the signals on them. Let's briefly talk about the layer stack up and the way we can do that in Outing Designer is by going to design and then layer stack manager. In the layer stack manager we can look at the stack up. We also have tools for doing for presets so different number of layers. This is actually a 10 layer board. And the stack up I've defined with the help of the manufacturer. So I said these are my specifications. I want, for example, for a 0.1 millimeter trace width, I want roughly 50 ohms impedance with a certain tolerance. I need these layers, this stack up, these controlled impedance layers, and so on. So I have 10 layers. Starting at the top here, we have a signal layer, one ounce copper on the outer layers, and a half ounce copper on the, all of the inner layers. I'm using fairly thin dielectrics, especially these pre-pegs, you know, to 0.05 millimeters. And I've filled in these dielectric constants, which I've gotten from the manufacturer. So the way I do my stack ups is always try to have, or well, always have a ground layer adjacent or directly adjacent to a signal as well as a power layer. So a signal will always have ground and a power will always have ground adjacent to it. So that means you have quite a lot of ground layers, which means you won't have as many signal layers, but for EMI purposes and signal integrity, this is definitely what you want. And I'll leave a link to a Rick Hartley video in the description below detailing more about that. So I have signal, ground, power and power is fairly close to the top where all of the ICs are because then I have a shorter via length, a smaller inductance. So my energy that is stored essentially in this ground power pair can get delivered e more easily to the ICs with less inductance. So I have signal, ground, power, signal, ground, signal. So I have a strip line here and I have microstrip at the top and bottom, ground, signal, ground, and signal. So you type in all the dielectrics, you type in all the thicknesses, and the nice thing about Altium Designer is that it also has an integrated field solver. So a 2D field solver, which calculates impedances for you. So at the bottom of the window here, you can go to impedance, and you can see I've already defined two different impedance profiles. Effectively, all I need is a 50 ohm impedance, single-ended, and a 100 ohm impedance differential. So I've selected which layers I would like to route my 50 ohm, layer, my 50 ohm traces on, controlled impedance, and which are the reference layers. Then by typing in the width or letting Altium do the work, you can see for a 0.12 millimeter trace width, I get an impedance of, you know, roughly 50 ohms. And I can do that for all of my signal layers. For differential pairs, all I have to do is in the impedance profile on the right, select differential rather than single-ended, and I give it a little description as well. So for a certain trace width and a certain trace spacing between the differential pair, between the differential pair traces, I get an impedance of, you know, a roughly 100 ohms. For this design, it isn't entirely critical as long as you know you're plus minus 10%. Of course, there's going to be some manufacturing tolerances, but this was in discussion with the manufacturer as well.
VIA types, this is not an HDI board, so I'm only using one single type of VIA, as you can see in this VIA types panel down here. In Altium, I could add various different VIA types, micro VIAs, blind, buried, and so forth. But to keep the cost down, you know, I just went with a through-hole VIA. And the pad pitches of these BGAs aren't too bad. I have one with 0.5 millimeter pitch, and my FPGA is, you know, 0.8 millimeters. So a through-hole VIA will do just fine. So returning to my layout, you can see I have some of these layers enabled here. If I click on this button, I can see that I've hidden all of these ground layers. So I'll typically do for these designs always solid, hopefully fairly unbroken ground planes. So I have one on layer two, one on layer five, one on layer seven, one on layer nine. Because I have all of these ground planes, I need to stitch them together with all of these stitching viewers. So anywhere I've had space after routing, after layout and so forth, I have used a lot of these stitching viewers just to connect all these ground planes together where I have space. Now, of course, in higher density designs, it might be difficult doing this with through hole vias. So let me go in Altium again and hide all of these ground layers so we can see all of the routing going on. And let's start off with this power plane on layer three. Remember, this was fairly close to the top of the stack up. Comparatively to MCUs, you know, MCUs might have one, if not two different voltages, typically only one. For example, if you've seen the SCM32 videos, you'll have 3.3 volts. But for BGAs and for FPGAs and system on chips, you will typically have many different voltages, as we saw by this buck regulator. So underneath the bug, reg bug regulator, we have 1 volt, 3 volt, 1.35, 1.8, and so on. And these need to be distributed on the power planes below as well. So if I click on these polygons, you can see on the right in my properties window, this is 1.0 volts, which is led down to the core of my BGA, which is my zinc chip over here. I have 1.35 volts, which is underneath my DDR region. I have 3.3 volts over here, and the rest I just filled with ground. On this point, it's interesting to note because we always want to route our controlled impedance above references or you know, controlled references, not across splits, we have to make sure that any signals on layer four, at least any high speed signals, do not cross any splits. So that's why it's always preferred to have a solid ground plane as a reference instead of you know these cutoff power planes. Clearances are quite tight. I've had to go down to you know, about 0.1 millimeter clearance between all these vias. And you can see because of all of these through hole vias, because this isn't an HDI design, if I open my ground plane layer again, you can see it's kind of been Swiss cheesed quite a bit. Now you have these small necks, which, you know, given the situation is a bit better than just having large cutouts. But just imagine if you wouldn't have the clearance, you would essentially have this large ground plane void, which is horrible for signal integrity and horrible for EMI. So that's why there's a benefit in using HDI because you won't perforate your ground planes as much. But going back to this power routing, what we want is then to use the power layer and the interplane capacitance between the power layer on layer three and the ground plane on layer two to improve our power, power integrity and energy delivery into these ICs. Now keep in mind, I'm skipping quite a lot of these details to try and keep this video kind of short, but just give you an introduction of how you might go about one of these designs. Next, let's look at the BGA layouts and how we place the decoupling capacitors underneath these ICs. So because these are ball grid arrays, which means that we have the pads underneath with solder balls, we cannot you know, place our decoupling capacitors right next to it and expect to be able to root into or underneath this IC. What we have to do with BGAs mostly is place the decoupling capacitors on the other side and use vias to then go to the top layer and then connect with fairly wide traces into the pads. So the way you would typically do that, you would have these pairs of power pads, power including ground. So I have maybe this 1.35 volt pad here and this ground pad of my zinc chip. I would root out into this kind of dog bone shape with a wide trace into a via and the same thing for my 1.35 volt trace and pad. Then on the bottom side, so layer 10, I would have my decoupling capacitor, which in this case is a very small 0201 capacitor, as we can see on the right in the properties panel, and with a very short and wide as possible traces into these vias. And you can see I've, I've placed these vias as close, well, quite close together, enough so I get uh, enough that my internal ground players can pull between these vias, but also close enough so reduce the VIA inductance. This improves our power delivery. 
And this is what you then do for all these power and ground pins, and there's quite a lot of them in these VGAs usually. And you can see all of these decoupling capacitors are at different voltages and always connect with these kind of ground and power via pairs. I've had to use 0201 just for space constraints. Sometimes you can get away with 0402, for example, if it's a one millimeter pitch VGA, but for this, this has to do. For the DDR3 memory, I've done something similar, of course. I have my vias at the bottom, power and ground, always connected with a small decoupling capacitor. You can also see these larger bulk decoupling capacitors, so these 1206 packages over here, or these 1210 packages over here. And these have to be close to the vice, not underneath it, not directly next to it, but somewhere in the vicinity. So you usually have a certain radius of where you can place these bulk decoupling capacitors, and these might be 100 microfarads, 47 microfarads, and so on. So the smaller value decoupling capacitors you want to place right at either the IC pins or with vias connected to the IC pins. For these larger bulk decoupling capacitors, you have to place you know, somewhat in the vicinity of the package. And again, we have the same thing the QSBI and the EMC memory, where we have the decoupling underneath. So power delivery is already fairly complicated, in at least comparison to the microcontrollers we've seen previously on the channel. The next thing we need to look at is the actual routing. So we go to 2D mode, clicking 2 in Alton Designer, we have various routing layers. So my top routing layer, where everything is routed pretty much as a micro stick, at least the controlled impedance. I have my layer 4, which is an internal layer, which references the power layer and a ground layer. And I have some traces running there, as well as a lot of ground pores. Layer 6, which is rooted as a strip line, so dual ground adjacent to it. And of my layer 8, which again rooted as a um, strip line. And layer 10 is the bottom layer, which is rooted as microstrip. What you can already see, and which is a really neat feature in Altium Designer, is the color coding of traces. So for example, all if I zoom out, you can see all of these blue traces are actually the address command and control signals of the DDR memory. The green traces up here are from a certain byte group of the DDR data lines. Then we have, for example, these kind of pinkish traces are the programmable logic. We can use this color coding to our advantage. If I actually zoom in, Altium Designer quite nicely changes the scheme, and you can, of course, play around with the settings of how you like your traces to appear. We have that on different layers as well. So we can immediately see, okay, this is the address and command. These are the data lines of a certain byte group of the DDR memory and so on. And this makes our life a lot easier. We can also see that in the schematic. For example, if we go to the DDR page, you can see I've color coded address command and control lines, certain byte lanes, and so on. So you can really start in the schematic that the layout person, if that is someone else, has maybe an easier job. Now I'm sure you can get away with a lower layer count for this board. What I wanted to make sure, you know, this is has the best possible chance for signal integrity, EMI, and so on. So that's why I spread this out over quite a few layers. The nice thing in Altium Designer is that you can also specify package delays. So for DDR3 memory, we have to, at least in certain data groups, for example, address command and control, we have to match time, not match length, but match, rather match delays within to a certain tolerance. The problem is, however, packages, for example, like this, um, this sync package are wire bond packages. So they'll have a chip die and internally they'll have wire bonds connecting to the various pads. And these will be of different lengths. Internally, they might be rooted longer, shorter, and they will have different package delays. The nice thing in Altium Designer is if we click, for example, on one of these pads, you can see I've already included a propagation delay. So this pin, the data for the DDR memory, has a package delay of 46.4 picoseconds, whereas a different pin might have 61.8 picoseconds. And we have to take this into account when we are routing. So we can't simply match the length or the delays between all these lines, we have to actually include the package delays. If we go to the bottom left in Altium Designer and click on PCB, we have various different net classes. So if I click on the DR3 address command and control, we can see I have various net names and various delays over here. And these are including the package delays I've specified. Now you can see they're within a certain tolerance. The reason they aren't all exactly the same is because we have these DDR3 termination resistors here all around the package. So I've made sure that when routing from my FPGA, my system on chip to my DDR memory, those are all matched in delay. And after I've matched all the delay, I route them finally to the DDR termination resistors. So the critical length or time delay matching should be between from pin to pin, and afterwards, you should try and keep the length similar to the termination resistors. 
Now you can get away not using tone resignation resistors if we have a fairly low speed design and if these ICs are fairly close to each other. The length matching or the time delay matching you can do in various ways in Alton Designer. One is just to simply draw the traces by yourself using the control W command. So I could, you know, just root out and then watch on the left hand side as my time delay changes. That's one way of doing it and that's absolutely fine. But Altium Designer also has various neat little features. To come this meandering, you can see down here, if I click on it, you can see this is actually not the traditional differential trace, rather than entity to increase the delay time of this trace. And the way I can do that in Altium Designer, I could, for example, delete this and then go to the top under root and interactive differential pair length tuning. If I click on that and I click on one of these traces, you can see if I drag it along, I can change the properties of this accordion. I can use mitered arcs. I can use mitered lines or rounded. I can change the mitre. I can change the sp spacing and so on. And this is one way I can do, for example, length tuning. So this is one type where I'm increasing the length of both differential lines in the differential pair. Another type of tuning is this single line tuning. For example, here, there might be a skew between the positive and negative trace of a differential pair. And here I'm using a tool in Altium to match the length in the lines. So I can delete this and go to root, interactive length tuning. And then I can go along here. And this is then how I would do this kind of single line length tuning. And this also works, of course, for single ended traces and I can change my properties over here. So these tools I just shown you in combination with this PCV view is how I would go about tuning my lengths. And you would have to do this for pretty much for most high speed interfaces. So I did this for the DR, I did this for the programmable logic for the processing system to make sure the person that designs the carrier board has pretty much matched lengths going off from the system on module into these connectors. Also for the DDR system, I have these termination resistors and, so, and as I said before, I did the pad to pad time delay matching first, and then I routed out to these rather small termination resistors. And the length of these, these traces going from the pads over the vias to these termination resistors isn't entirely critical, but you should try and keep, you know, with a similar order of magnitude and length. So one side of these termination resistors connect to the address command and control signals of the DDR lines, and the other side connects to these 0.675 volts, which if you remember from the power supply section was half the DDR voltage. So this is the DDR termination voltage. And this comes from this DDR3 termination regulator. Pretty hefty bypassing on the outputs and inputs and using a power plane with thermal relieves to connect to these rather small 0201 components to make sure you know I don't get any tombstoning and so on. And I'm fairly evenly placing these various decoupling capacitors for my termination resistors as well. Another point to mention is here, this EGA, which is the main siling system on chip, has a pad pitch of about 0.8 millimeters. Over here, this is the EMC memory, which we can use for program storage or general storage for the system, it has a very small pad pitch of 0.5 millimeters, which is, you know, not great. Luckily, a lot of these pads are no connect or they're not tied to anything, which means we can use a lot of them to actually route through. For example, this B2 pin down here is the actual EMC third data pin. And this A1 pin is, you know, not used. To get out of this, I would have had to use a very, very tiny trace or an incredibly tiny via. But instead, I routed from B2 over to A1. So I designated this as the same net. And that's where I can route out. So this is a way I can escape from these rather small pitch VGA packages, for example. The main routing bits are, of course, this DDR memory, which we saw before, but also this processing system, MIO outputs and inputs, as well as this programmable logic inputs and outputs. And you see, I've tried my best to do kind of length matching to get pretty much very close lengths matched, which then go into these mezzanine or board to board connectors. Just a few more final notes. I know this is a very brief overview and just gives you a general gist of what you might expect with one of these designs and how they differ from MCU designs. Here we also have these clock or crystal oscillators. This 33.33 megahertz oscillator drives the, the processing system. Whereas this 100 megahertz crystal oscillator is optional and it drives some of the programmable logic fabric. You can also use this clock up here, the 33.33 megahertz clock, derive via PLL to drive the programmable logic system.
the actual input pin to these clocks is pretty much directly underneath the BGA. So it's hard to root in from the outside on the top layer. And that's why I had to place these crystals on the bottom layer with a via into the BGA on the other side then. So this is typically fine if there's no other option, but of course you would usually not want to use vias on these traces. When it comes to the programmer logic connectors, you can see I have this grid always alternating between ground and signal to make sure every one of these pins has a proper return path. And I have this pretty much for all of these other connectors as well. Some other notes might be you've seen in this corner on the bottom left of this board are these numbers one to 10. If I go to the 2D view, you can see it's layer one, layer three, four, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, and so forth. And this is just to indicate also to the manufacturer what copper layer they are currently on, just to you know, prevent mistakes and so on. Other than that, of course, you have to add some sort of silk screen just to indicate, okay, maybe if you want to test these boards, this is the 3.3 volt rail, 1.0 volt, what these LEDs mean, maybe your logo, website, and of course, date when you maybe finish this board or design this board and bridge revision number as well. You can also see these small holes at the top right and bottom left of this board are essentially for digital marks, and this is for the tooling when it comes to assembly of this board. So I'm currently getting this board assembled and manufactured and have it back with me in about a month or so. And then we'll go over what this looks like in real life, so to speak. So I hope this rather small and brief overview of the layout and routing of this system or module was a bit, at least a bit useful and you expect to see more of this content in the future. So please do like the video, comment and subscribe if you haven't already. Thank you very much.